Thomas Green here with Ethical Marketing Service. On the podcast today, we have Phil Fraser. Phil, welcome. Hi, good afternoon, Tom. How are you doing? Marvellous. Would you like to take a moment and tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do? Okay, so uh, there's two parts to my to, to who I am, really. Um, I spent 18 years growing a business from a uh, kitchen table startup all the way through to a PLC sale. Uh, that sale went through in 2018. I'm now working as a business coach. I call myself a business sounding board, working with SMEs um, to help them grow their businesses. So passing on the experience uh, that I that I learned over those 18 years and, and hopefully helping, uh, helping other businesses be as successful or trying to be as successful as we were. Thank you for the introduction. Um, you, it's, it's a nice segue into my first question, which is um, you position yourself as a sounding board. For those that don't know, um, what is a sounding board, a business sounding board? Okay, so um, it, there's, a, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. In terms of, okay, what, what do I do? I answer that, that whole cliche thing of it's lonely at the top. You know, when you're running your own business, there are certain aspects of, of the business that, that you just can't discuss with other people. You, you know, you can't, you can't talk to your sales manager and, and say, look, hang on, we're, we're a bit in the shit here. What should we do next? And, and as a business owner, you're the one the team come to for the answers. And, and sometimes, and, and many business owners will know this, and I, I had it when I was running my businesses. I don't know. I'm making this up as I go along. And actually, you know, to have somebody you can sit with, um, without any prejudice, without any bias, without any politics, and, and completely openly say, Phil, I've, I've got this issue, I, I don't know what the answer is, or I'm thinking of doing this, does it sound stupid? Or I've got four ideas, I'm not sure which one's the best one, can you just listen to me? Or even um, working as a, a somebody to, to, to really be responsible for. So if I sat down with somebody and say, well, two weeks ago, you said you were going to do this. Have you done it? You know, one of the beauties of running your own business is you can do whatever you want. You're not responsible to somebody. And, and that's good because you can take your business whichever way you want. The bad side of it is you've got nobody saying, well, you know, did you do that? So the sounding board bit is, is sort of part mentor, part business coach, um, but very much, you know, I've been a business owner. I'm just slightly further down the, the same track that you're on. How can I help you? Mm. I, something that you mentioned, which I've found is, is totally applicable to me, which is having someone to talk to about maybe things that you're not 100% sure on. Um, just having that conversation can sometimes give you the ideas. So if it's all in your head, then that's kind of where it stays. And maybe you don't make much progress in the way that you would do. And if um, unless you took, spoke to someone and when you speak to someone maybe that's not even them that gives you the answer it's yourself have you ever found that to be the case uh, absolutely that is 100% the thing I, I will often have people who come to me and say Phil will you just listen and and all I do is is prod and poke why have you said that what's the benefit of that and and you know after an hour they say Phil that's absolutely fantastic thanks I know what I'm going to do and I think well I actually <laughs> didn't actually say anything and it's I sometimes compare it to um uh in Harry Potter do you watch Harry Potter uh Harry not it's been movies? a while but yeah it's been a while um so Dumbledore has a pensive if you remember where he takes he sort of pulls memories out of people's minds in effect and, and that's what I'm doing is is the answer is in people's heads I'm just prodding and poking the the corners where they where they sort of find the answers themselves which they either knew or they ignored or they hadn't thought of or um, were just were there and they didn't, they didn't think that would be the answer to the problem. So, so, yeah, a lot of the time it's just, and it's that concept of verbalizing something solidifies it. So if you, like you said, you've got an idea in your head, you sort of roll it around. But if you actually say it to somebody, as you're saying it, it solidifies and you either get to the end of the sentence and think, no, that's bollocks, isn't it? Or you, or, or you get to the end of the sentence and think, yeah, yeah, that does that does stack up. Yeah, it's a good idea. And I've not mm. done anything. I've just sat and listened. So that's where the sounding board thing comes in. Although a bit of it is also imposter syndrome in me, uh, not wanting to sort of put my head above the parapet and go, yeah, I'm a fantastic coach and I'll make your business 10 times better. Mm. Well, um, as I mentioned before um, we started recording, 
I watched your story, which um, I will put in the show notes for other people to watch because I think you were super prepared and you went through it with, you know, your screenshots and stuff. And I think that's probably the best video regarding your story that, you know, we. I don't think I would be able to get better than that than what you did there. But what I did I have is um, a bunch of questions that perhaps might be valuable to the audience, which I think um, are going to be applicable. And one of the things which I think you emphasized a fair amount in in the story was um, when you hired someone who challenged you. So, um, I mean, the way I put it is like a, a leader, someone who's going to lead your team, but also challenges you as the business owner. Would you, um, for people that perhaps haven't considered or done that themselves, would you like to elaborate on why that was beneficial for you? Okay, so th there's a sort of bit of precursor to that. Um, before we finally sold the business, we, we had put the business up on, on the market um, and for various reasons we didn't sell. But we always had a plan B, which was uh, to bring somebody in to run the business while I sort of took a step back. And that's where bringing in a, a number two came in. I've, I've actually written a whole um, blog about it. So if you go to my, we'll talk about my website later, but if you go to my website, it's a whole story about how, how to recruit a number two. But one of the things he said to me in the initial interview was, are you really ready to let go? Which was a really pertinent question because if, you know, when, when you've been running your own business, you've been the boss, you make the decisions, you make the calls, you decide what goes on. When you bring in a number two or, a, or a, you know, a, a COO or a second in command, whatever you want to call them, um, you have to give them the reins to be able to make those decisions. Now, you know, there is something inherent, I think, in all business owners that you know, they want to be the general, they want to be in charge. So actually, it's, it's you have to be self-aware to be able to go, look, this guy's going to now make some key decisions. I've actually got to let him make them, whether I think they're right or wrong, um, because that also then sends a message to the team as well. So the first time one of your team comes into your office and says, Phil, you know, can we discuss this? You have to say, no, go and speak to the number two but what it does do is it challenges your thinking because as a business owner you're going right you know we've done it this way and we've always done it that way and this is the you know this is the roadmap when somebody comes in and goes well actually that roadmap's either wrong or or i can improve it or or you know we can get from a to b but we don't go this way we go that way you have to allow them to do that and a lot of that trust is built obviously by experience, but a lot of it is built inherently in where, as you do the recruitment process, because you've got to get the right person on board. Um, and it's a it's a learning process because you have to learn, you have to relearn what your role is, because your your role becomes limited because some of the stuff you were doing as the boss, you give them to somebody else. So one of the key things I found was that actually I recreated my reason for being the business whereas he took some of that stuff away you know the day-to-day -day, the management the staff the sales strategy my role was developing him and looking at the bigger strategy but also being the bit that the proper grown-up business owner whose role is is actually to put the tools in place to allow the number two to make the decisions he does so if he says look we need another web developer we need another salesperson you as the business owner have to say right yeah the funds are there to do that so it's 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 a fascinating process because it challenges lots and lots of different things but it's a big step change it's quite interesting that he perhaps had the foresight right at the beginning to say are you sure you're gonna let me make some decisions here um the the thing which comes up for me is because i can imagine i'm sure there are hundreds or thousands of scenarios where people have hired someone to run a business and they have and haven't done well at it. Have you got any thoughts about that particular? Um, I, one, one of the things we did, um, and I can't remember where I picked this up, um, but one of the key things I thought was, obviously the guy's got to be able to do the job and he's got the skills and all that sort of thing. But I thought one of the key things is I have to get on with this person you know, on a personal level. And what I did was, um, we went through obviously a recruitment consultant, but what I did was I said to the recruitment consultant, I want to go and have coffee with all the applicants before we do an interview. So no CVs, no meeting room, it's coffee and a chat, 
just to just to get a feel for connecting with the person. And that was fascinating on a number of levels. But one of the key levels was people dropped their guard because, you know, when you go to an interview, you, you're on, you know, you're on interview mode and, you know, you've got the, all your questions ready and all that. You know, where do you see yourself in five years? All that sort of stuff that we get told we're supposed to do. Just go, right, we're going to have a coffee pre, you know, pre-interview. And it ticked lots of people and put crosses in lots of things. So, so I think a lot of the planning is important, but that, as the business owner, I think the key is you have to be ready to let go. And that's, I think that's difficult for an entrepreneur because that's not the way we're built. We are entrepreneurs. We are business owners because we want to do it our way. We can do it better than somebody else did. We've got that burning passion. And then to say, okay, you do it. You know, it's a tough one. But again, there's lots of preparations that's got to be placed. So things, you know, we ran, we had a, um, a BHAG on the wall, big, hairy, audacious goal, which obviously you've heard from Jim Collins, good to great. So as long as you're all heading in the right direction, it's a question of just how you get there. And if he, you know, if your number two decides you want to go this route or, you know, in, in you know, one of the things he particularly did with over a, probably over a year process, got rid of two or three members of staff and brought in two or three new ones. Now, is that pointing the finger at me saying I've recruited shit staff? You know, it, it, it may be, it obviously may not be, uh, but, you know, as a business owner, you've got to hold your hands up and go, yeah, if you want to do that, you know, knock yourself out sort of thing. There's a big trust element in it, which is why I think that the coffee worked really, really well. Mm. You just, yeah. The key thing is you've got to have clear parameters and be willing to let go. I think they're the, they're the important things. And an emphasis on the um, when you're hiring, do as much of um, due diligence as you possibly can. Because you did, yeah. was it three interviews? Yeah, so we did a... We, with everyone, we did a coffee. Uh, we then did the sort of formal you know, CV, talk me through your career, that sort of thing. And then the third one we did, so the second one was like, can you do the job? Third interview was, okay, if you, got the, if you got the position, how would you do the job? So we actually gave them a scenario that they had to do a presentation for. And actually, we went through this process first time around, and we got to the end goal. We had one, one lady who was, who was up for it. And we just didn't think she was right in the third interview. We went all the way back to start and started again. Um, so the, the you know the process is is important. Interesting. One of the things which you said was beneficial was the weekly one to one staff meetings. Um, but what I didn't um, get from that was what was it? Uh, what was the change? So the before and after in terms of why that was beneficial? Uh, that came from um, a podcast I picked up on holiday uh, called Manager Tools. I think the, the, uh, the website is manager-tools.com. And they have, it's, it's been going years and years and years, but they have these three basics to their management training. One is one-on-ones, one is delegation, one is uh, feedback. And the one-on-ones were, were something that's key to them, which is, the, the either the business owner or the team manager has a half an hour meeting that is fixed in the diary every week with every person, and it's the person who who's uh, you're meeting with they they set the agenda, and it's not a it's not a work in progress meeting it's not a, it's not even it's not even an appraisal it's just okay if we were doing it with Tom okay what do you want to talk about this week. And it might be something at home that's pissing you off. It might be something at work that's pissed you off. It might be you just want to talk about your career. You might want to talk about training. It could be all sorts of stuff. And what – there's obviously a lot of psychology underneath it. I think it, it says to a lot of people, you know, they care about me. They care about my opinion. They care about where I'm coming from. They care about what my issues are. But I think from a business point of view, the more you understand your team and your, your team members – the more you can mold and manage them to do what they're there to do. So in, in our one-on-ones, you know, I had some, some, some staff who would just would keep it focused on work in progress. They just didn't want anything else to happen. Other team members, I had about you know, grandparents and dead cats and boyfriends and all that sort of stuff. But if you know and you show you care what's going on in your, your team's minds, I think 
that really really helps and also if you you know if you're if you're the sort of company who does let's say six monthly appraisals which i think are terrible um you know somebody sits there and goes well five months ago i had this issue well, absolutely pointless discussing it five months later you know if it's you know i've got probably dave who sits sits next to me you know, I don't know he's got bo you know something really minor or you know i've fallen out with my boyfriend and i'm moving out yeah you know, these all these sorts of things i think it, it's it's at the personal level um and like i say some people didn't like them some people wanted them but you have to say right these are, and and manager tools is brilliant i would strongly recommend anybody who's got a uh, uh wants to develop themselves as a manager i think it's brilliant very american but but great stuff yeah um i it makes me think of a conversation i had around um I was trying to um, get better at, you know, rewarding staff members. Um, and someone introduced me to the concept of uh, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations, I think was the term used. And um, extrinsic would be like pay, bonuses, that sort of thing. Intrinsic would be about, you know, what's important to them. And I can see how you might be able to, knowing them better, in the way that you highlighted, it would be easier to um, make those distinctions. What what do they care about, and how can you facilitate that? Essentially, absolutely, absolutely. And, and yeah, the bigger your team gets, um, the more varied the, the type of person you have on the. You know, inevitably, you will have that. Um, and it's it's you know, part of it is is just about caring about your team. Part of it is is motivational. Um, a part of it, I think, particularly, I think, particularly junior staff just like the fact that you know we. I think our team, the biggest we got to was about thirteen. But you know, junior staff thinking oh, the the boss is interested in me enough to give me half an hour every single week. Whereas the more senior people think, oh, I've got I've got a hotline into the boss. I'll I'll give them my idea as to what's going wrong with this business and how it should run, which we you know, which we also have. Yeah, I've also done a, um, had a lot of conversations around um, servant leadership, and the theme there is to talk with your staff. You know, be seen, be approachable. So there's a lot of there's a lot going on there with those weekly one to one staff meetings. It, it is, it is, and, and and you know, I'm sure people are listening to this going, "Hang on, I've got a team of six, and I've got a that's half an hour each, and then there's the preparation before and the preparation. That's four or five hours a week. I can't afford that. Well, I'll tell you what, it's worth it." And you know, as your team grows, and, you know, it, it, you then feed it down to reports. So you have, you know, let's say you've got a team of six, you would do, you know, the, you do the one-on-ones for the three heads of department, and the heads of department would do the one-on-ones with, with what, what the Americans call their reports, you know, the people who report to them. Um, but it's it's fascinating stuff. And one of the other things that's that's great in manager tools was all about feedback. And they've got a brilliant feedback model, which. I tried a few times, word for word, for, for the way they did it, and it was just like magic. It was, it was just to explain. It was, very, I won't tell you the exact wording because I can't remember it. But it was basically, it, it was, it was sort of one minute feedback. It was Tom, can I give you some feedback? And like immediately, you go, oh shit, I'm in trouble. But actually, what you're doing is you're giving positive feedback. So Tom, when you, you know, when you did that, that was really good. Carry on doing it, and that's it. And you go, oh bloody hell. And it's all about it's about actions rather than you know, and and it's just it's it's really really clever, really clever stuff. Good. You mentioned your um, national TV advertising in your story. Um, yeah. As you know, I'm interested in that topic. So I mean, in terms of process of how you went about it, and then results and tracking the results, can you can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah. So we. Um, just to give you, just to give your listeners an idea of what we were doing, we, our, 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 we owned a website called Which Bingo, which was basically the trip advisor for online bingo, the review site. And we were very keen to be number one, but but very very much uh, the sort of go-to place to go. And obviously, you can you, when you've got an online business, the big thing is SEO and traffic and PPC and all that sort of stuff. We wanted to go a level above that, so we thought, okay, how do you do that? The best way to do it is TV. 
which again was sort of quite a big scary thing because we're only a website, you know, that sort of thing. Um, fortunately, my background was advertising. I worked in an ad agency for six years before we set the business up, so I sort of had a feel for it. But we we used a local agency who I knew. We gave them a really tight brief. Um, we gave them a budget, and they did the media buying for us. Um, and the beauty about TV media buying, very like PPC media buying, um, if you set yourself a really tight target, you can get really targeted results on pretty low trafficked um, TV channels. The sort of you know, the sites you get to at the end of the day when you're really bored and you can't think of something to watch. God, who watches this stuff? You know, those sort of channels. Um, so the 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 aim of the uh, campaign was partly branding and partly traffic. Um, and the thing with, with because we were an affiliate, so although our site is a destination site, we make money, in essence, from people then going to, to uh, brands that are advertising on our website. So we reckon we broke even sort of on a, on a financial point of view uh, within three months. Um, but the big upside was the fact that we were on TV because that positioned us in the market as this isn't just a, you know, a WordPress hobby site out of somebody's bedroom. This is a proper big player. Um, and it was part of a, a bigger campaign to really position us as a major player in, in, the, in the industry. We also produced an, an annual industry report. We also ended up doing industry awards as well. So it was part of the big picture. Um, and I think still, even nowadays, you say to somebody, oh, you know, our company, we advertise on TV. That's cute. Yeah, people give you kudos for doing that. Um, so it was part of a bigger picture rather than just, um, you know, we spent X, we get Y back. Is but there yeah, any chance we, that you think that it helped you with the sale of the business at all? Uh, yes, probably, because it was part of that positioning of, of the, the site. I mean, as I say, we were an affiliate website, um, and you know, it's very easy to knock up an affiliate website on in any sector. So it's a very low barrier to entry. So we had to really, you know, we had to be the titans in our sector, and it was part of that. And and obviously, from a from an acquirer looking into the sector, we go okay, who's who's the number one? Who's the number two? Yeah, it's them. They have their own awards. They're on TV. They run an industry report. Yeah. And that's before they even look at the numbers and the traffic and the revenue and all that sort of stuff. So, yes, I think it probably did as well. Well, that's a pretty good investment then, I suppose, especially if it ended up so. being free for you. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. You mentioned the um, the awards ceremony. I think yeah. it's really cool that you, because um, essentially it's a decision, right? I'm, we're going to decide, um, make our own award ceremony. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the... The process that you decided to do that, how it went, and then um, you also mentioned some celebrity PR, which I think again is going to be invaluable. Yeah. But I'd love to know a bit more about that. So we um, very very early on. I mean, we st the, the the website launched initially in two thousand, so we were there sort of right from the start. And very early on in our journey, we 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 uh, created an, an awards so site of the year and new site of the year which in essence were, were player voted. So it was, it was a traffic driver come to the site to make to vote um, and a bit of PR on the back of it. And we email the winner and go, hey, you won our site of the year award. And they get a little graphic and, and hopefully they link back to us. So we get some link, we get some link juice as well. So it was really, really basic, really basic traffic and SEO stuff. Um, and over the years that sort of grew. And a couple of members of my team said, we should do this as a proper awards. Um, and our industry had a couple of broad-based, we were obviously part of the online gaming sector, so there's online casinos, online sports betting, online poker, and online bingo was, was part of that. And there were, there were a number of industry-wide awards, which were sort of big, you know, dinner jacket dues, you know, spend a fortune, all that sort of thing, which fortunately we won quite a few of as well. So I was, my mindset was, nobody's going to come to our awards. You know, we're, we're just, you know, we're just a website. And, and eventually I gave in and the sort of main protagonist, I said, right, okay, you can project manage it. Um, so we went through the whole process of, okay, we need to, so we, we found um, like an events agency up in, Le we're in Leeds. Um, we sorted us out a venue in London um, 
And then we sort of promoted it to all our clients and said, look, you know, we do this awards ceremony and you've got to, you know, you've got to promote these awards because you want to win, we, you want to win one of these awards and you've got to promote it to your players because they've got to come to the website um, to vote. So it was, it was, it was sort of part PR, part branding, part traffic, part SEO, all sort of rolled in together. And we took the decision quite early on, particularly the first couple of years was this was a marketing expenditure. So it's going to cost, you know, I think somewhere between 15 and 20 grand or something. It was quite, you know, quite a hefty whack, but it's, it's worth it because it's, again, it's part of the whole positioning thing. And so we all took the trip down to London and we put this event on and it went amazingly well. So we did it, every, we started doing it every year. Um, and the second, this is, I think it was the second or third year we did it at Madame Tussauds. No, we were going to do it at London Zoo. And for whatever reason, they couldn't host it. And they said, oh, well, you know, we're part of the same group as Madame Tussauds. Do you want to do it there instead? We'll, you know, we'll do it at the same cost. We were like, yeah, of course we will. <laughs> so we did it at Madame Tussauds and it was sensational. It went absolutely brilliant. But one of the fantastic things that happened was um, one of the things in the online bingo sector was very easy to, to produce um, a new bingo site. It was just a reskin. And one of our clients had done a deal with Kerry Katona, who's always great for PR, called Bingo with Kerry, which is great because obviously it's targeted right at her audience. Um, and it was the year that she was, she'd launched, so she was part of the new site of the year. And she won. So we got loads of photos with Kerry Katona holding one of our awards in front of our sort of, we, we created a, we got some sponsors, in, but we created a board like you get a, a uh, when a manager's talking at, at football, so we all, you know all the brands, are. and she promoted it, and it got promoted all over the place. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, but from a again from a from a branding and positioning point of view, it was fantastic because the whole industry wanted to be there. Everybody wanted to win an award. We used to you know afterwards we turn up at people's offices and you know they had them in reception behind the receptionist and all that it's just <laughs> fantastic and you know, they all took pictures and selfies and they promoted them around and they said hey we want to win which bingo water and it just worked fantastically well i think we broke even on it one year i think with a sponsor but it was worth have it you um, got any thoughts on because i can see it being highly beneficial but um in terms of how someone might do that um when they're in an industry so they're not like uh because you can promote other people and it's not not a problem for you yeah, right yeah if you're in an industry have you got any thoughts on that um i think you have to have it's a it's a little bit chicken and egg i think you have to have the kudos to be able to do it so you can't sort of start up a business six months later right we're going to be we're going to do sort of the industry awards and you go, well, who, who are you um it's got to be legitimate. So it was, all of ours was clean and above board. It wasn't paid for, none of that sort of nonsense that people do with industry awards. Um, and I think there has to be some value on it. Um, you know, if you said, with all due respect, you said, hey, you've won the Thomas Green Award this month. And they go, who? Why? What is it? You know, it's got to be, it's got to have some kudos. So, so it's a bit chicken and egg. You have to, as a as a part of that industry, you have to have some kudos for it to have some value because then potential winners will value it and then they will market it and you know, it sort of goes round and round in circles. It's a bit, you know, I use TripAdvisor as the example. If you go to a restaurant now and it's got you know, a TripAdvisor sticker on the window and it's got, you know, we're a five-star TripAdvisor restaurant, it has some kudos. If it's, you know, the John Brown Restaurant of the Month Award, who's John Brown, you know? But it, but as a as a as a branding and a positioning, I think an award ceremony is fantastic. Well, John Brown's got some kudos now, though, because uh, <laughs> you just mentioned him. Every, right? Everybody's going to want a John Brown Restaurant Award now, aren't they? <laughs> exactly. Um, well, yeah, I, I get the idea. It's kind of like a snowball effect, right? So, yeah, have yeah. some authority, build it up over time, and then. Um, it might be worth something, but yeah, yeah, just the the idea that it was just an or an idea in someone's mind and then it came this big thing it's just it's just one of those cool things that is yeah. just a nice story to listen to yeah there were lots of ideas well, there was lots of ideas we had that that didn't get off the ground as well but i won't discuss those <laughs> well i mean that's really intriguing during a conversation yeah. isn't it but um the the important thing i think um 
You mentioned someone in your story, I think it's like a LinkedIn profile that you that you highlighted. And I think that person um, advised that you started recording uh, regularly your stats. Um, yes. So stuff that maybe people should be doing that they aren't doing. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you started getting more disciplined with that and it haven't had an impact on your business. Do you mind sharing that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So we had, um, I mentioned getting a, uh, my, it was a, he, he, his job title was commercial director, but my number two. Um, and we were a couple of years in, we were discussing strategy and which way to go and all that sort of thing. And, and we had a, you know, three or four ideas. So we actually, what we did was we said, Oh, we'll get, a, we'll get a, a consultant in and see what he thinks. And, 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 um, he did a number of really brilliant things. Um, one of which, which is dead simple, and I've done it with a couple of clients already, um, was, was he did a 360. So he interviewed every member of staff, you know, what's good about the business, what's bad about the business, you know, where do you think there's opportunities, all that sort of stuff, and, and, and fed that back. But what he also did, he, he came from a manufacturing background. So he was very numbers and widgets and pounds, shillings and pence and the whole sort of thing, which we weren't because because it, the business was owned by myself and my wife, there were no shareholders, there was nobody to report to. It was, we kept an eye on the important stuff, but not some of the sort of secondary sort of uh, KPIs. And what he said, he sat down with us and said, okay, you know, this is, this is your financial goal. We had, a, obviously we had a number we were aiming at. He said, okay, what are the, what are the key parameters that, that will make you make that happen? And, you know, obviously things like sales and, and stuff like that but it was things like traffic and, and and various we ended up i think with seven or eight different parameters and he used a system which was um he called it a weekly drumbeat meeting and it was a stand-up meeting once a week and so what we'd done is we we determined what these parameters were and we determined what the target was for those parameters and then each week we put them we, we do a this five minute drum beat meeting when people reported what those numbers were and they were either red or green. So yes, we've hit it or no, we haven't. And then it was a case of, okay, well, if we haven't hit it, why haven't we hit it? What are we going to do to hit it next week? And that made us a lot more formal in terms of what we were trying to do rather than the way the business I think had run previously, which was sort of just roll with it and we're doing okay. So yeah, we'll carry on doing it. It was a lot more uh, what I call grown up business. Whereas before we sort of, However it happened, we were doing quite well and numbers were rolling in. So, yeah, we'll carry on doing Well, this was, he'd come from a big, I think he'd come from a PLC, I think, previously. Um, so he gave us some proper grown-up parameters. And what that did, that contributed to when we finally sold, probably two, three years later, we were in much better financial health than we had been because we were looking at numbers. We were looking at the right numbers rather than just some of the numbers we wanted to look at. I can imagine the the spreadsheet um, being highly beneficial as well. So if you've got a yeah. load of red on there, something's very wrong. And if you've got a load of green, yeah. you know you're going in the right direction, right? Absolutely. And and one of the things that was that was uh, what he did was was I think if I remember right, there was an annual figure and a, a sort of a monthly figure, so we knew sort of which direction we were going in. So a lot of the time, obviously, the annual stuff was was red because obviously. It was annual, you know, you're not going to hit it towards the end. But the weekly or the monthly stuff, we were green. So week one, like for sale, if we had a figure for sales, week one might be red, week two might be red, week three might, might be green because we've hit this month's target. You go, fantastic. You know, then week four is even, even greener if you, can, if you can have it even greener. Um, but, yeah, it made us focus on, because we'd done this whole process, it made us realize what the key parameters were that were, in, that were key indicators as to we were doing the right stuff. So it wasn't just, yeah, we've sold 50 grand's worth of stuff this month, fantastic. It's actually, we've sold 50 grand's worth of stuff this month because this parameter, that parameter, and this parameter were going in the right direction. Whereas previously, I think we just went, oh, we've sold 50 grand this, this month, well done. Yeah, there's some, sounds like there's some 80 20 in there as well, focusing on absolutely. all the right stuff. Yep, absolutely. Really interesting. So it brings me to, Kind of my last category point, um, which I think is probably is going to be a big, <laughs> a big part of it, and that is the selling of the business. 
Um, you've got a successful exit, but I, I, my guess is that there's a whole big story about that process. And um, I mean, I, I got from um, the, the story video that someone outbid the original buyer, um, but you know, I'd, I'd love to know about the, the process, how it went um, pretty yeah, much the lead it. up right up until the funds go in your bank account. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we could, have we got another half an hour? We can, <laughs> we could do the whole thing. Um, so, um, in, in our, I mentioned we were in the online gaming sector in the, in, in the sector, there were four or five big, uh, acquisition companies who were just buying up smaller businesses. So it was quite, it was quite an active M and A market. And a lot of that was public. So, you know, we knew who was buying what and, and particularly interestingly, how much they were, or broadly, how much they were paying. And over the years, as we'd grown, we'd had quite a lot of people who'd come to us and said, you know, are you willing to sell? And I'd always said the same thing, which was, you know, if you put enough money on the table, you can have the keys, you know, very simple. We're not for sale, but, um, and for whatever reason, I've got a drawer full of NDAs and no, no deal happened. Anyway, so we were approached by one of these um, acquisitors who said, right, we're interested in buying you um, and gave us an indication of the number uh, that they were willing to pay. Now, that number was big enough for us to go, ah, this is quite interesting. So we went down to London, met them. Um, what transpired was the number that they'd said or alluded to was lots of caveats and lots of yes, well, and you know, all this sort of thing. So I thought, no, it's not, not right for us. But what I did, and because it's quite a small industry, I, I basically spoke to the other acquisition companies and said, look, we're not for sale, but if you're interested, you might want to talk to us now because we're, you know, we're talking to somebody else. And one of those companies came forward and said, we're interested. Um, got quite a long way down the line with them. And what happened was one of the other companies who previously said we're not interested actually came out and said, well, actually we are. Now, I'm very much a man of my word and, and don't like going back on deals with people. And, and we were actually just about to sign an NDA with the, with the second company. Um, and I, I said to the other guys, I said, look, if you're going to do it, you've got to, you know, you've got to move the dial a lot further to maybe change horses. And they came back a, a week later and said, right, here's a number, which was, and not only here's a number bit, but a, a, a very, uh, a more improved uh, structure from a financing point of view. So I had to go back to these, these other guys and said, look, I'm really, really sorry that, you know, this isn't a negotiation thing. We've been approached by somebody else. We're going to go with them. Now, obviously, they were pissed off. I didn't like doing that, but you know, these things happen. Um, and actually, what, what transpired was we, I did the deal over the phone, a couple of emails with the CEO quite quickly because it was somebody I, I knew before. Um, but then we had four and a half to five months of legals, partly because they were, although they're a, they're a PLC, they're non-UK, um, they had American trained lawyers. We had obviously English lawyers and, and American law and English law is like speaking two different languages. So that complicated things because they were a PLC, the sales director wanted his 10 pennies in the deal. The finance director needed something in a deal. The CEO wanted something strategic. So, so we had lots and lots of backwards and forwards. Just, it was annoying. It was like changing like two sentences and then we'd go around in circles and they'd be changed that third sentence to change for God's sake. So it took about four and a half to five months from agreeing the deal to signing the deal. Uh, we had a three month handover. Um, I was asked very early on in the, in the, in the process, do you want to stay on? I said, no, just you know, give me the money. I'll, I'll walk away. We had a three month handover. Um, the payments were, were structured throughout that three months. And, uh, the, well, two of the hardest things I ever had to do were the day I had to walk into my team, into a team meeting and say, hey, guys, we've, um, we've sold the business and they don't want you. They didn't want any of our staff, which was just a horrible thing to do. I mean, really, really horrible. It took me, it took me three goes to get out of my chair um, to get to the door, to open the door, to go to the meeting room. It was just really, really difficult. Mm. Um, so that was that was really difficult. And then the final day that we actually worked, so three months later, was you know we'd handed everything over and 
you know, over a three-month period, we almost got to a point where my team was saying, look, Phil, I've got nothing to do. I was like, well, you know, just hang around and, and whatever. And then the last day uh, was a Friday, closed up the office, went for lunch, then all went to the pub, and sort of one by one, people were going, and it was right. Okay, bye. Not like see you Monday. It was like, okay, bye, which was just heartbreaking. <laughs> it really, really was. Kind of weird. Um, yeah. It was just really, really, really weird. And and yeah, so the good thing, the good thing out of it from the team's point of view is over that three months, I said to them all, look, get yourself another job. You can go to as many interviews as you want, you have as much time off as you want. Plus, they also got a loyalty bonus for staying for the three months. So a lot of them sort of left on the Friday, got a new job on the Monday, arguably with better money, and they were all fine. But during that three-month period, a lot of them said to me, you know, I'm, I'm really sad about this because I really want to stay working here. You know, you've done the right, you know, and they all said, you know, you've done the right thing, and all sort of thing, but I really like working here, which is a real, you know, was nice. And, and what's really nice is I've kept in touch with, at least six or seven of them are in touch with on an almost weekly or monthly basis. Um, one of one of the team I'm still playing five a side with. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really really nice that they've you know that they do keep in touch and a couple of them have come to me for advice, um, which is great. You know we must have, we must have done something right somewhere along the line. Is there any possibility that when you go back to the original buyer um, that? you then lose both your buyers if the deal doesn't go through? Uh, you could do. You could do, you know, until, until with any deal, until you've signed a piece of paper. Um, actually, it's not even until you've signed a piece of paper. It's until the money lands in the bank. You know, there's always going to be issues. Um, and this was one of the beauties of the deal we did. It was, it, it was quite clear on, on the cash. It wasn't, there wasn't an earn out. There was, it wasn't subject to figures. It was, you know, that's the money. That's how it's going to be sliced. That's the dates it will land. A couple of them were, on, were caveated on stuff we had to hand over, which is fair enough. Um, but yeah, on on any deal, and and you know, I I I've got a very good friend who who's a business broker or, or works in corporate finance that sort of stuff, and and he said to me, he advised me a lot during it, just as a hand holding, sort of going back to the sounding board thing we started right at the start. You know, just yeah, you know, one of the things people always say in a business saying is, don't tell anybody. Don't tell any of the team and carry on doing business as if it's not going to happen. Which is why when the day I walked in and said, right, we sold the business, everyone was like, what? Yeah, there was nothing. There was no sniff of anything. Um, but that, that whole, you know, everything has to carry on. You've got to assume that the deal isn't going to happen until, you know, the first, the first pound hits the bank. Mm. And you said it took four or five months. Is there anything that you would have done differently to ensure that didn't happen, let's say, the next time around? Uh, I think we, I mean, my, our lawyers were saying quite early on, you have to get them to get some English lawyers on this. That was the first thing. Um, I think, and I don't know why it was, we spent a lot of time on heads of terms rather than on the, on the SPA. Um, but I suppose if you do it on the heads of terms, you don't do it on the SPA. Um, I think they were the, own, the only things really. Um, you know, we were, a, let's say, we were a, a dozen, dozen strong business. They're a PLC. It's quite hard to sort of stamp your foot, particularly when you, particularly and when there's sort of pound signs right in front of you. And that's the danger. And that's always the danger, I think, with anybody who's thinking of selling their business is they start spending the money, psychologically start spending the money and they take their life the business. Mm. Because there's so many things that could go wrong um, that you've got to assume it's not going to happen until it happens. Because if it ha if, if, you know, the day before we signed, if they said, you know what, we're not going to do it, my team and my business just has to carry on on the same numbers. Plus also, if, you're, you know, if it's taken four or five months and you've taken your eye off the ball, and your numbers are starting to drop, they're going to come back to you and say, well, actually, you know, before you were doing X, you're now doing Y, we're going to chip the price. Mm -hmm. So it's in your, it's in your benefit to, to, you know, work even harder. Is there, what were you doing on the day that the money landed? And what was that, what was that like, that, that process? 
uh, what was I doing? I think I was in the office, but the it was it was it la- it the first tranche landed in in uh, my wife's and I, well, actually it was in the business account, um, and it was quite big. And I just I just looked at it. And, Hell, <laughs> I took a, took a script. <laughs> sorry, excuse the language. Um, took a screenshot of the bank. Of, of, of it online and just sent it to my wife and it was just like <laughs> which doesn't sound very professional or very business like but when it does happen like that you just go what that's ridiculous um so yeah that was that was uh that was a, that was that was a fun one because mm-hmm. again it because it was and an, it got it got slightly complicated, and because they're a PLC, various people have to sign different bits of paper. So it's like, oh, it's going to land at ten o'clock in the morning. So I'm like, ten o one, ten o two. I'm refreshing the phone, and it's not there. And I'm pressing F five on my computer. So I sort of call them at lunchtime. Oh, you know, the FD hasn't isn't in this morning or something. Well, all he's got to do is sign this bit of paper to make this money go across. So those sort of things um, are probably more stressful, you know. Because they're they're you know they're a PLC. It's like oh, it's, you know he's probably in a pile of five or six different bits of paper he's got to sign, and mine's just one of them. And I'm thinking, sign the bloody bit of paper to make the payment go. <laughs> I was going to say, were you hitting the refresh key? Oh, absolutely. My my F five just has an F on it now. <laughs> <laughs> Anything um, to note on the you know for for others about the concept of selling a business? Um, I think one of the one of the key things we learned um, well, there's, there's two or three things, and and, and I, I think one of them is getting a CEO, or sorry, getting a COO or a second in command in place is important because you, as the business owner, have to make yourself redundant to sell the business. Um, yeah, if you take a very simple example, if you're a a, a plumber and you're a one man band, you can't sell the business because you are the business. You sort of extrapolate that out. You need to get to a point where you are, yes, you're important to the business, but you're not important to the day-to-day running of the business. So the first thing is you have to get yourself out of the business, make yourself redundant. Um, and the best way to do that is to do a, is uh, to do something somebody told me was called a two-week holiday test. If you go on holiday for two weeks, what happens to the business? Does it carry on and runs fine? Or are you sat by the pool you know, on your phone every day? Because if you are, you haven't got a sellable business. So that's the first thing. Um, I think the second thing is to understand market prices. So if somebody comes to you and says, I'll give you a million pounds for your business, you might go, hey, that's fantastic. But actually, if you don't know what the your industry multiples are, you don't know whether that's a good price or a bad price. Did you do any valuation yeah. for your business? Yeah, so we, what happened was, as I said earlier, we, our sector was quite public in, in the sort of multiples that were going on. So we knew what a, what a good offer was and what a bad offer was. Um, so we had an idea of, so we looked at it as multiple. So I think the industry multiples were something like five to five and a half. And I think we got, we got more than that. Um, so you have to understand what your, and also on what, your industry values on. So is it on profit? Is it on uh, average uh, annual repeat revenue? Is it on turnover? Is it on staff base? Is it on customer numbers? You you have to understand your industry's metrics and what those multiples are to then go, there's actually two things you can do. Number one is you can then say, well, if somebody offers us this, it's a good price or a bad price. You can do it the other way around because somebody again said to me, the first price that everybody wants for their business is number of shareholders times a million pounds because psychologically everybody wants to walk away with a million pounds. So if you know what the multiples are, you can say, okay, well, if we all want to walk away with a million pounds, we have to get to this figure because that's what the industry is buying at and, and we can work it out. But you can't say I want a million pounds for my business if the industry multiple is three and you're making hundred grand a year. So you've got to understand that. So the first thing is, is make yourself redundant. The second thing is understand the market. The third thing, I think, and we failed at this, was because we were privately owned, as I said, it was just myself and my wife. We didn't track data the way the industry tracked data. 
So the way, so when a buyer came to us and said, you know, what's this figure? What's that figure? What's that rate? What's that churn or whatever it might be? We weren't keeping that data because we weren't using it. It wasn't useful for what we, what we did. We had the data, but we weren't analyzing it the way uh, the industry buyers were doing it. So the, 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 the thing to do then is to ensure you are collecting and recording data the way buyers want it. So if they want, if your industry is very focused on monthly churn rates, you should keep a track of your monthly churn rates, Even whether, you, whether you use that data or not, just so you've got it. Because what we had to do, or I had to do, because nobody else was knew about it, I had to go backwards and recreate all these, uh, all this analysis from the data we had, but in the format they wanted it. So that's, that's, it, that's important as well. Um, Sounds like a fun job. Oh. <laughs> one of one of the worst one of the worst things, and this, anybody who's got a tech company or anything to do with the website will will appreciate this. Um, because it was obviously a website, um, for whatever reason, their techies wanted to see our code. Now, you know, as the CEO or the owner of the business, I don't I don't have any passwords. I don't know how to log into the back end and stuff like that. So they said, we want to see the code, you know, we see your raw code. I said, well, I haven't got the password. So I had to sort of create a scenario within the team that we needed to sort of rehash our security and, and put all our passwords in a, in a file so I could access it and I knew where it was and all that sort of thing. So I sort of lost this request for the back end passwords in, a, in the whole sort of company thing so that I could then share with somebody. So again, and, and again, that, that was an interesting one because a lot of techies will comment code. So, you know, this line of code does this, this line of code does that, that sort of thing. So somebody else looking at it understands what it is. When you're in a small business and you've only got a small web dev team, they'll just code and often not comment it. So I had these tech, we, we had to log in, we did it on a Sunday morning, it was ridiculous. We had to log in on a Sunday morning so they could see the code and I could watch them. They were going, well, what does this line do? I don't know. It's not commented. I have no idea. I, I'm sort of very basic HTML and that's it. Um, so again, and, and that leads on to probably the other thing that's important is, is contracts. Because when you buy a business as a buyer, you want it to be as, uh, as safe and as solid as, as, as you can. So you want to see your know, client contracts, supplier contracts, staff contracts, that sort of thing. If you've got a business where, Dave down the road has worked with you for 10 years and you know there's nothing in writing that's inherently of no value to a potential buyer because Dave might just go oh, I'm off mm. now you as the seller you go well you know Dave spends 100 grand with us a year well, where's the contract so those sort of things yeah you know, as I say client contracts supplier contracts um finance on assets, that type of thing, uh, staff contracts, all those that sort of dull paperwork that, again, is probably in most businesses somewhere, but isn't in a file that a potential buyer can go, right, show me all your, all your client contracts. It um, reminds me of what you said a moment ago. Did you call it adult business, adult businesses? Yeah, it's, or? Proper, it's, proper, it's proper grown-up business. Grown-up, yeah. yeah. Well, is there um, anything that, when you went through your story on that um, video that you wish you had have ad added at the time? Uh, ooh, that's a very good question. Uh, anything I've added? I mean, that was, I think the, the video you're referring to, I think I had 30 minutes or 40 minutes to do. Yeah, the, it took 18 years from startup to sale. Yeah, there's, there's tons of stuff. There's lots of blind alleys. We went down, lots of ideas. Um, that didn't work, various ideas that did work. I mean, one of, the, one of the things, I don't know if I referred to it in the video or not, one of the things we did uh, was we borrowed ideas from best practice from everywhere. So we used, so we had a directory section of the site um, and we said, okay, who's got the best directory in, you know, on the internet? And I think one of our guys was a keen film fan, he said, Rotten Tomatoes. The rock tomatoes, the film review places, you, know, you get green tomatoes and red tomatoes. So we basically took their idea and we ended up with green thumbs up and red thumbs down and we tweaked it and that sort of thing. For our news section, we said, OK, where's best practice of news? Right. The BBC News website. So, OK, what does that look like? We built it around that. Um, 
So I think, you know, you can take best practice from all over the place. I mean, we, we borrowed an idea from, uh, is it, I think it's Amazon who do, you know, other people like this product. So we, on ours was like, you know, other people who looked at this bingo site liked these two or three bingo sites and it just adds traffic and all that sort of thing. And we, we tested lots of stuff and some of it worked and some of it didn't work. Um, and we were refining all the time, but I think that that's probably the key one is actually you can take best practice from all over the place. Mm. That's a, um, a business principle that um, I think has been used. Uh, a story I think of it is um, it was, it, it, I'm not sure which way around it was, but it was, I think it's like the, the fast food uh, drive through was inspired by the bank tellers, the cashiers, because it was taken from one industry and applied to another, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And the the the, the, motor, the Motorola Flip was taken from Star Trek. <laughs> I didn't know that one. That's true. Apparently. That's cool. What are your goals, Phil? Uh, my goals, my goals. As a, as a sounding board, what I'm looking to do is take on, I mean, I've only been doing sounding board business coaching for about a year. My target is to get 10 clients, which doesn't sound a lot, um, but I want to be able to give those clients the best, the best of me um, and the best value. So 10 clients by the end of the year would be great. Very specific. Well, you know, if I get to t- yeah, the entrepreneur in me will go, right, you've got 10, what do you do next? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, is it more kind of like a, lifestyle business for you that's 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 the other thing it, it, it is lifestyle I, I really love talking to people about their businesses um you know when you sit on a train or you sat by a pool or you're on a, your aircraft with somebody and you're going you know what game are you in and they go oh you know we make i know we make pens and most people go oh, bloody hell let's talk about something else and i go you make pens how, how does that work how did you get into that market what is you know what's the profit margins like so i love talking to people about their businesses um so it's an enjoyable thing. And 10 gives me lifestyle enough to, to not be running around like a headless chicken. Um, I do some voluntary mentoring as well. So that fits in as well. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a lifestyle business, but I enjoy it. And hopefully I can pass some of the value of what I've learned on my business journey to other people. Because what you tend to find is most people have similar problems. Mm. I think um, the, the peer group guy you interviewed a few weeks ago was saying, you know, most people have got, you know, a terrorist member of staff. We had one of those. Um, yeah, they want to increase sales. They don't know how to increase their profit. They've hit a wall. Yeah, a lot of people have similar similar business issues that they need to discuss, irrelevant of sector. Well, um, if there's anything like this conversation, I'm sure your coaching is um, highly valuable. Um, Thank can you. you tell people where the best place to find you is? Okay, uh, the best place to find me is either on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn most days, so it's just Phil Fraser. Uh, my website is www.philfraser.co.uk. Don't go to philfraser.com because that's a medieval reenactment costume company. So if you see lots of pictures of Robin Hood, that's not me. You're in the wrong place. Um, and all my contact details are on the website. If anybody just wants to chat, very happy just have a, a chat with anybody. Um, and if it leads to working together, that'd be fantastic. If it's just a chat, absolutely fine, no problem at all. All right. Well, um, really appreciate the value today. I think it's been, you know, I've, I've found it really interesting. So I'm sure other people will as well. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you for having me on. No problem.